بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh So inshallah ta'ala my approach to the tafsir will be of a linguistical of a literary approach. And the focus, inshallah ta'ala, is to demonstrate to you how every surah is a cohesive, unified argument. There's a lot of things that happen into a surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about himself, about, then he speaks about prophets, then he'll speak about the day of judgment, then he'll speak about stories of the past. It's mixed. And how is this all related and connected together? That's inshallah something we will demonstrate. And just to understand this concept even further, a surah is called a surah and it comes from the word asur. Asur, what it actually means is the outer walls of a city. The outer walls of a city. So in the old days, there were no boundaries, there were no signs to tell you go left, go right or Welcome to Canberra or welcome to so on. There was none of this. It was just a outer wall and the city was inside. And that outer wall is called a sur. And within this sur, there are people, there are houses, there's markets, there's military, there's government, there's everything going on in this, in this sur, within this sur. And somehow everything is connected to each other. That's why the city is functioning. And similarly, the surah, is called a surah, which came from the word sur, because it is a wall, and within this surah, there are lots of things going on. And somehow it's all related and connected to each other. And inshallah ta'ala, we can demonstrate and give the first example in this surah, surah al naba when we begin inshallah ta'ala. Uh, another thing that I'll be approaching and demonstrating is how the beginning of a surah is also related to the end of a surah. And this is what makes the Qur'an amazing. And what makes it miraculous and unique. And also the third thing inshallah ta'ala will focus on is how the end of a surah connects to the surah that comes after. So you have surah al naba and straight after surah al naziat What's the connection? This is really amazing things. This is really profound. It's really miraculous. Inshallah ta'ala you pay attention. And you find out exactly how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, how he relates an ID and how he delivers an ID to us. And you have to understand that Juza Amma, most of it is Makki Quran. It was revealed on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before his hijrah, in the time he was in Mecca. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's predominant audience in Mecca are the pagan Arabs, Mushriku Quraysh, right? And there are the believers. <clears throat> but as we read this verse, or these verses, I'll always relate you to putting your shoes in the position, or put your shoes in, in where the Arab is standing. So you can comprehend, because Rasulullah is reciting to them. And these Mushrikun, they're not asking Rasulullah, what's the tafsir of this, and what's the tafsir of that? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing out the ID and proving them wrong and proving some things right logically and what's around them. And it's amazing how it's done in the Quran and the word choice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses. So inshallah ta'ala to begin, Surah al naba is the 78th Surah in the Quran. The Surah before it, Surah 77, is Surah Al-Mursalat. Surah Al-Mursalat. How are they connected? That's what we're going to start with. In Surah Al-Mursalat, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions two groups. <clears throat> the first group he mentions, إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي ظِلَالٍ وَعُيُونَ Certainly, verily, the muttaqin, the pious, will be amidst shades and springs. In other words, in Jannah. That's the first group. And amazingly enough, we find in Surah Al-Naba, 
the surah that comes straight after, إِنَّ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ مَفَازًا Certainly for the believers, they will have success. And this success is Al-Jannah. So it's mentioned in Surah Al-Mursalat, it comes again in Surah Al-Naba. That's the connection. The second group that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Mursalat, and it's a phrase, it's a ayah, that often recurs in that surah. And it comes over and over. And that is, وَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذِ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ It comes nine times in that surah. And al-mukathibin, this, this concept of al-mukathibin is being repeated in that surah. And al-mukathibin are people that lie. And not only lie, they deliberately lie against the people that speak the truth. So now to understand the connection between that and surah al naba Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins Surah Al-Naba' by saying, عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ A very vague and rough translation will yield, what are they asking one another about? Now in order to understand the connection, we need to speak about the word يَتَسَاءَلُونَ <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that there's a conversation happening. What are these groups questioning and asking one another about. Now when someone asks a question, it's done in two intents, one of two intents. You either ask a question because you're curious about something, you want to know something. So you ask, what's the time brother? You want to know what the time is? That's one intention. Another intention in asking a question is to undermine or wage sarcasm at someone else. So for example, the Prophet ﷺ is presenting to this believers about the reality, the truth of the Day of Judgment. So he's speaking about really, really huge, enormous events. You know, the oceans are going to be set ablaze, the stars are going to fall, they're going to lose their light, the sky is going to tear apart. So what do the disbelievers do? So they can mock and insult the Prophet ﷺ. They ask one another in the intent of mockery and sarcasm. So one of them will go, Did you see what I was speaking about yesterday? He said the oceans are going to blaze, are set ablaze. All the mountains are going to sail. Do you hear that? Yeah, I don't know, the mountains are going to sail. And they'll ask one another a question, not in the intention to learn something, rather in the intent of mockery and sarcasm. This is Amma Yatasa'aloon. So they'll talk about, you know, ah oh look, he's saying that we're going to come out of our graves like locusts, you know, or we're going to come back to life. Did you hear that yesterday? Or what he was speaking about yesterday? And this is going to happen to the mountains, they're going to become carded wool. That's unbelievable, you know, and they'll mock it, and they'll, they'll poke mockery at the Prophet ﷺ through asking the question to one another in the intent, of undermining the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now you have to understand that the worst way, the worst possible way of being sarcastic and undermining someone is asking a question in that intention. And this is وَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Those that deliberately lie against the people that speak the truth and mock them and make fun of them. This is Wailu Yawma Idil Mukadhibin, and that's the connection to Surah Al Naba. Allah is speaking about these people. Now Amma Yatasa Alun. It also suggests that there's a third party involved in the conversation. So actually for Yatasa Alun asking one another, there are three opinions that the scholars have mentioned. Either it's the believers asking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or it is the disbelievers and the disbelievers arguing with one another and asking one another. And the third is that both groups are asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the most correct opinion is that yatasa'alun 
is referring to the disbelievers asking one another in the intent of sarcasm and mockery. And this will be apparent as we move along in the verses, you'll understand how. So we said there's a third party involved here. The Prophet ﷺ is listening to their sarcasm. The disbelievers are making the sarcasm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening as well. And so Allah says to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ And the language of the verse also suggests that Allah is angry with them. Because He turns towards His Messenger and He says to His Messenger, عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ What are they asking one another about? The verse wasn't عَمَّ تَتَسَاءَلُونَ It wasn't a ta, rather it's a ya. And this is giving us the impression that Allah is angry with them. Because tatasa'alun would have meant that Allah is directing the speech to them. He's looking at them and he's saying, what are you asking one another about? But that's not the case. Allah has proved over and over how this day is going to happen. Rasulullah, 10 years in Mecca, giving da'wah, and still it doesn't go through that thick head. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really upset and angry he now looks at his messenger and he says, What are they asking one another about? So the conversation continues, And this part of the verse is a continuation of the question. And before this, some, some things they were saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Really? When we become reduced to dust and we're withered away, are we going to come back in a whole new life? That's not possible. And someone, some of them would say, when Rasulullah recited, alayha tis'ata ashar, on the hellfire there's going to be 19 guardians protecting. They say, one of them said, oh, it's only 19, I'll take them on. See the sarcasm and the mockery. This is, وَيْلُ يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ and that's what they're asking one another about. <clears throat> what is the core question? What's it all related to? عَنِ النَّبَأِ الْعَظِيمِ So it's like the verse is translated to as, are they really asking one another about the Naba al Azim, About this really great, great news? Now the word an naba has a synonym. That is khabar. Naba means news. Khabar also means news. So what's the difference between the two? Why was one used and the other wasn't? Firstly, naba means a greater news. Something really great. Khabar doesn't necessarily mean something great. So for example, I say that the masjid doors are going to close at 8 o'clock today morning. That's khabar. Really, it's not great. But if I was to tell you, and just like we always hear, there's a bombing that just happened in Lebanon. There's this gas thing that happened in Syria. That's naba. That's big news. That's great news. It shocks you when you hear it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word khabar in the Quran twice when he spoke about Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam is in the desert with his family. He's in the pitch black in the dark night and he sees a fire up on a mountain. And he says to his family, You know, you guys sit down here for a second. I'll go up to the mountain. Maybe I can get some khabar from there. Well, it's not big news because he's not even expecting. He doesn't even know what's going to happen. So khabar, maybe perhaps get some direction, get some uh, fire, you know, and then come back and warm up with it. So that's khabar. But when Allah uses naba in the Quran, He says, أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ نَبَأُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَبْلِ أَلَمْ يَأْتِهِمْ نَبَأُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Hasn't the great news of those that came before him reach them. In other words, Allah used the word Naba to explain how he destroyed nations. That's a great event. You know, Allah destroyed this nation by a cyclone. He destroyed this nation by drowning this nation. He destroyed Qarun by him being sunk into the earth. And so this Allah refers to Naba because it's great. Now, another implication of Naba. Khabar, I said, is something normal. It doesn't demand from you anything. But khabar, naba, sorry, demands a reaction, demands action. 
So for example, I say to you, there's a fire in the building. That's Naba. What does that demand of you? To leave the building. Move out, do something. And similarly, Naba is something that's great, that you're supposed to be moving, shaken by it, so much so that it calls for an action. So how does this verse relate to me and you? Allah is referring to the Day of Judgment as Naba. Meaning every time we hear about the Day of Judgment, every time we hear about the punishment, that's supposed to do something with us. We're supposed to act, to keep away from it. It demands a reaction and action from you. And another thing about Naba, is that it speaks about something physical, something tangible, something that's touched and seen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uses the word Naba, and the, the Quraysh, when they're listening to this word, they're actually, it's like the word is depicting to them that, yeah, this is a serious day, it's actually physical. You'll see it and you'll feel it. And khabar, not necessarily. So I said, khabar, the doors are going to close at 8 o'clock. You know, that's probably something you just hear. That's, khabar is different. Naba is something that's physical. So just by this word, Allah using it, He's already depicting something great. It demands from you a change. And by the way, it's something physical. You're going to feel the punishment. It's naba. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds an adjective. He says, Al-Azim. Al-Azim means great. We already said, Al-Naba means great news. So when you really literally want to translate this verse, it'll come to, they are asking one another about the really great, great news. That's the translation. Now you want to really understand how big this day is? Al-Daktur Ratib al-Nabulsi, he says in his tafsir, he says, حَجْمُ الْكِبَرْ يُؤْخَذُ بِحَسَبِ الْقَائِلِ That something is big according to who speaks it. So if a little kid told you, I have a lot of money, what are you going to expect? Hundred dollars maybe? If an adult tells you, My, I have a lot of money, you know? What are you going to think? You're going to think in the hundred thousands. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this is a great, great news. So how big is the news? How big is the day of judgment? And how big are the events that are going to happen on this day? And Allah, He adds the adjective, adjective al-azim. That's as a response to these people. So are they really questioning one another about this enormous great event how do they mock it so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's he's responding and why 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 a big deal if you what's what's the big deal if you believe in this day or do not believe or ask questions about this day you know let's put it in a simple example and a simple example would say that it's really irrelevant and senseless to go up to your principal in the university or in the school and ask him, so is there going to go big to exams at the end of the year? That's a senseless question. To ask the teacher, are there going to be exams at the end of the year? You know why? Because the school, it has put so much effort, so much money in its classes, in its labs, in its equipment, getting the best teachers, the best equipment, the latest technology. And after all this, care put into the school, into the university. You think the one that doesn't study is going to equal to the one that studied? Or the one that was absent is equal to one that was putting so much effort and didn't miss a day? It's not fair. There's got to be an exam at the end to see who was good and who was bad. Similarly, this universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put so much care into it, gave us so much. And you think that at the end you'll leave and the one that was sick all his life is equal to someone that was healthy all his life? Someone that worshipped Allah all his life? Equal to someone that bludged all his life? Is that the case? So it's a really silly question to begin with. You don't ask if there's going to be a day of judgment or is there going to be a result day. Logic will tell you that for sure there is. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alladhihum fihi mukhtalifun. Alladhihum fihi mukhtalifun is the second adjective 
of an naba. An adjective is a describing word. An naba, we said, is great news. The first describing adjective, the adjective for an naba, was azim. The second description for naba is al hum fihi mukhtalifun, which roughly translates to that which they are in disagreement with. This day of judgment, they're in disagreement about. Now, what does this give us of a meaning? Allah says, pay attention, alladhihum fi mukhtalifun. As opposed to saying, alladhihum fihi yakhtalifun. Mukhtalifun yakhtalifun. The difference is that mukhtalifun is a nominal sentence. It's a noun. And yakhtalifun is a verbal sentence. It's a verb. And understand this from now because it's going to come with us a lot. If a noun is mentioned in the Qur'an, it's depicting permanency. Noun, nouns are permanent. Verbs are temporary. So now by saying a noun is permanent, and Allah is using the noun here, it means every single time these disbelievers meet one another, the only talk is, did you hear what he said? And did you hear what he said? Ah, oh, today something new was said. Ah, oh, yesterday he said he saw uh, this and he went up to the heavens. Ah, oh, yesterday he said this. Tomorrow he's going to say this. In other words, Mukhtalifun came in the noun form which depicts permanency. So every single time, permanently, these people are asking one another about this day. That's the, the idea it gives us this word and the way it comes. Another thing is that the normal sentence structure should be الَّذِي هُمْ مُخْتَلِفُونَ فِيهِ The word fi should come at the end. But when it comes before مُخْتَلِفُونَ It gives a meaning of shock. It produces shock. Meaning, are they really in disagreement about this day? Is that the case? And مُخْتَلِفُونَ comes from the word اختلاف. And it has two meanings. The first meaning is that it's a manifest disagreement. In other words, what it really means is that amongst themselves, everyone has his own theory about the Day of Judgment. So some would say, ah, now who are we to, for Allah to bring us back? Some would say, no, we're all going to heaven. Others would say, look man, Allah created too many things. And uh, I don't think He's got time to record every single thing I did. Different theories. They're in one another, they're in disagreement amongst one another. And also what it gives of a meaning is that they're mukhtalifun, they're uncertain themselves. So one of them would say, oh look, we're all going to heaven, but he's really not sure. And the other would say, oh, no, it's impossible. Where's Allah going to bring us after we've become bones? And then rather not bones, just bones, we'll become dust, we're finished. But he's, he's saying this and he's uncertain. He's mukhtalif. There's ikhtilaf into him. So subhanallah, yani, even those that deny the hereafter, wallahi, in their heart there's something that's telling them there is a hereafter. Atheists and also all those religions that deny the hereafter, they all are not certain about it. All of them are uncertain. And they have some doubt. But it's because the desire speaks, the soul speaks, they don't want to face the reality, just deny it. It's not going to happen. It's too much. How's Allah going to make it? How's it going to happen? Too many people lived from the beginning up until now. When is Allah going to bring us back? So this word مُخْتَلِفُونَ is giving us all these meanings. It is even telling us about the people that do not believe in the hereafter. Next time you meet them, keep going and keep going in your da'wah. Crack. Let him crack at the end. At the end, a kafir, when he becomes a Muslim, it's because he was in doubt initially to begin with. If he was certain about his religion, he'd never leave it. And you'll find so many that come from their Christianity, their faith, or whatever it is into Islam. Because to begin with, they're in doubt. Allah is telling us. They're uncertain of their own religion. So when, they, when you convince them enough, it's very easy for them to, to do that, to convert and to come into Islam. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ Nay, they'll soon come to find out. Nay, they'll soon come to find out. That's the old English translation. So what have we realized? There's repetition here. Allah said, سَيَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ Same thing is happening. Why does He repeat this? So we're going to speak about the repetition. And one of the main purposes of repetition, whether in the Qur'an or in general speech, when we talk to one another, it's for al-mubalagha, for hyperbole, to emphasize on something. You know? So as we said, the old English translation will yield, nay, they'll soon come to find out. And the word kalla, it carries two meanings. It only depends how you recite the verse. So some of the scholars would say, it is allowed to recite kalla and stop. Then say sayalamun. And it is also allowed to say kalla sayalamun or one. So when you read kalla sayalamun, thumma kalla sayalamun, it has a meaning. Kalla here would mean stop. In other words, these, these disbelievers are arguing amongst one another, asking one another, did you hear what he spoke about? Did you hear this? How's this going to happen? And all of a sudden Allah says, stop. Kalla. Enough. Sayalamun. You'll soon find out. Kalla sayalamun. Thumma kalla. Stop. You're soon going to find out. Stop rolling your tongues and making fun and making mockery. It's already been 10 years or so. And you still haven't come to the conclusion that this is the real news. Enough. Very soon, each and every single one of you will find out the reality. The other meaning it gives, and, and you know like in, in, in general use, when something is really dangerous and you're telling someone to stop, you don't say stop once. You repeat it. Stop, stop. This is the same thing. It's repeated. And we find it in our general use of speech as well, in our general sp speech. Another opinion, and that is when you read the verse all together and you do not stop, it gives a different meaning. It is associated with haqqan. Meaning certainly they'll know very soon. Certainly they'll know very soon. So how is kalla, which means no, how does it connect with the meaning certainly? You know, really a good example for this is, you know, when you speak with one another, uh, you'll say, oh no man, I'm going to be late. Oh no man, you don't mean no. But you mean, oh certainly I'm going to be late. For sure I'm going to be late. But the word no comes in your speech. And what actually it means in that context is that for sure you're going to be late. So that's another meaning of kalla. If you continue, it'll mean certainly you'll know. Very soon you'll understand what's happening. Now, sayalamun. Allah says sayalamun. This scene is short for sofa. Meaning soon they'll find out. Very soon. You'll find this coming again in Surah At-Takathur. Inshallah Ta'ala, when we get there, we'll explain it. Where Allah says, ثم كلا سوف يعلمون ثم كلا سوف يعلمون. Here it's the abridged version. The scene only, without the woe and fa. And what does the scene indicate? It indicates closeness. That's at the beginning of the surah. What comes at the end of the surah? What's the last verse in the surah? Who knows? Inna anzarnakum azaban qariba. We've indeed Certainly we've warned you of a close punishment. So at the beginning Allah mentions closeness, and at the end He also brings the same idea of closeness again. That's the connection also between the beginning and the end of the surah. Allah says, كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ And it also depicts that Allah Azza wa Jal is really, really angry and upset at them because He repeats it twice. Repetition is done when you're angry. You know, you see to your friend, just watch and see what I'm going to do to you. Just watch. You repeat, watch, watch. You're really angry at him. So Allah Azza wa Jal is angry. And this anger, it's depicted from the verse because it's repeated. Certainly you're going to, you're going to find out very, very soon. It's just a matter of when you're finished. Now, 
The first kalla sayalamun has a meaning, and the second kalla sayalamun has another meaning. There are two events. Now you understand this, insha'Allah. The first kalla sayalamun, certainly you're going to find out very soon, is speaking about al qiyamah, day of judgment. When is the day of judgment for us? You know? Everyone's day of judgment was when you die. Man mata qamat qiyamatuh. When you die, that's your day of judgment. That's it, it's over. You don't have to wait for the stars to fall and the sky to rip, to tear apart, and for the sun to come out from the woods. You don't have to wait for that. Once you die, that's your day of judgment. It's over. Kalla sayalamun, you are going to find out very soon when you die. You'll see the reality. Thumma kalla sayalamun, second time you're going to find out is when you're in front of the hellfire being pushed in. So the first one is being actually speaking about al qiyamah about your death. And the second, kalla sayalamun, is when they're standing in front of the hellfire, just about to be pushed in there. Or actually, they throw themselves willingly, because we take that from the word, tasla naran hamia. They willingly throw themselves, after the horrors outside, they're finding some sort of escape, some sort of refuge, some sort of shelter, they think that's where it is, they throw themselves in there. Really gets intense. So this is the two kalla sayalamun speaking about two different events. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins a new passage. And there's something miraculous in the Qur'an, and that is as al qurani The rhythm scheme in the Qur'an. So you'll find there are verses that rhyme. Now pay attention, listen to this. عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ مِهَادًا What's changed? The ending. It's become an alif now. وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادًا وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا it, it's all ending with the alif. And this is giving us a meaning of some sort. It is actually telling us that the passage has changed to something else now. But it's all connected. We'll connect it once we finish it. All these alifs that are coming now. Allah right now is going to speak about His favors. And He's going to speak about things that should give you the impression and the idea that there is the day of judgment. Subhanallah, watch how it happens. Allah says, Alam arda mihada? Haven't we made this land, this earth, a plain and smooth field? The word mihada comes from the word mahd, which literally means the cradle. You know, Allah speaks about Isa man kana fil mahdi sabiyya, a baby in a cradle. And mahd also refers to the womb of the mother. But there's something common about all this. And that is they share the concept of comfort. So the baby in his cradle is comfortable. The, the baby in the womb of the mother is comfortable. Also the Arabs used to refer to Mahd as being a bed. The bed that they sleep on. When you think of the bed, you think of peace and tranquility. Of a comfortable place. Allah is saying, أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ مِهَادَ haven't we made the land a comfortable place for you? Haven't we made it so much so that there's so many peace and tranquility on the land? That you roam freely on it? That it's really comfortable to walk on? Allah is speaking about His favors in these verses. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing in these verses is that He's bringing us, so He is actually inviting us to compare what He has created to what we have created. Now watch this. The Arab listens to Alam Naj'al al Arda Mihada. To the Arab, what's Mihada? A bed. Allah is saying, Is this the bed you, you made? Look at the bed I made. Look at this whole earth that I've made. You're boasting about this small thing you've made. Is this what you have come to? Making a bed this size? Look at the bed I've made. Look at the creation I've made. That's one thing. So, right now, these verses, as they're coming, it's putting us into our place. Your position is right here. And this is what Allah is doing. And by the end, you cannot even move left or right or speak anything. You're put at the end, that's it. You must be convinced that seriously this is happening, this Naba'ul Azim. 
So Allah, He explains His favors upon mankind. He says, وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادَ And the mountains as pigs. Mountains as pigs. Now, what a, is a pig that's used for what? For the tent. And a whole tent is referred to as a what a, as a pig. You can basically look at the tent and say a pig. Because things are known by their main or their important element. So for example, a soldier, you can call him a sword. Because that's his important element. That's the sword. And the tent, if it doesn't have pegs, it's not stable, it will fly away. So it's known by its important elements. Allah is saying, وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادَ The mountains are pegs for this land. And subhanAllah, something scientifically miraculous in this verse is that scientists have come to know that the, size, the shape of a mountain that's above earth is exactly the same below the earth. So you have the V up the top, you also have a V down the bottom. It's literally pegged. Now look at this. An Arab in the desert, he makes what? A tent. That's where he lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is depicting in this verse, is this the tent you've made? Are these the pegs you've pegged? Look at the pegs I've made. Wal jibal. Compared to that. And that's why on the day of judgment, there's iva zulzilat al ard. The earth will shake, will tremble. A massive earthquake will happen. So much so that the zilzal in the verse comes twice. Zulzilat al ard, zilzalaha. It violently shakes. You know why? What happens to the mountains? It'll become carded wool. It'll wither away. It'll become reduced to dust. Once there's no mountains in the earth, once there's no pegs onto the tent, the tent flies. Once there's no pegs, the mountains in the earth, the earth is shaking. It's not stable anymore. So Allah again is calling them. Is this the, is this the peg you made? Oh, look at the pegs I've pitched. Compare. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings it even more closer. And we created you in pairs. You weren't even capable of choosing your own gender. Can you? Someone choose his own gender? So how is this type of arrogance coming out from you? Allah is saying there's a day of judgment and you're saying there isn't. It says it's impossible. The idea is flawed. وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ azwaja is referring to something amazing as well. You know it's referring to the day of judgment? You want to know how? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمِن كُلِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنِ Everything we've created in pairs. Now look at this. The Arabian, these are really people, smart people. They know the Arabic language. They can relate to themselves. Allah is saying we've created everything in pairs. Male, female. Sun, moon. Evening, oh sorry, morning, night. The day and the night. Everything is created in pairs. A sky and an earth. A life and an afterlife. How is it possible? Allah is saying we've created everything in pairs. You're denying the afterlife. Look at everything around you, how it's in pairs. This life is paired with the afterlife. It doesn't make sense that there's only a worldly life and it's ended. There has to be an afterlife because everything we've created in pairs. So this is an invitation to ponder. There has to be. It just only logically means that there's an afterlife. And we have made your night, your sleep a rest. Literally, subata, the Arabs would say, sabata sha'rahu means he cut off his hair. So literally, subata means to cut off. In other words, what's been said in the verse, and we have made your sleep a cut off. I cut off from what? Two things. When you sleep, your body is cut off from your soul. And that's supposed to give you the idea of death and that there's an afterlife. Because also you're cut off from worldly affairs. 
So perhaps this morning as you're driving here, the world is dead. It's a time of sleep. The world is cut off. People are cut off their worldly affairs. جَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata. Subata also comes from the word Sabbath. Sabbath means what? Saturday. What happens for the Jews on Saturday? They rest. They take a rest. So also Allah is saying we've made your sleep a rest, a cut off from this world. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, sorry, this is, وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata. You couldn't even control your own sleep. You eventually at the end of the night, you're forced to sleep. You couldn't control this. How do you again come up arrogantly against Allah and say there's no day of judgment? Here, I've given you a small disc so you can taste a bit of the reality. And I've cut you off this world so you can taste a bit of the reality that when you die, you're also cut off this world. Then when you sleep, do you wake up? You wake up. So what said that when you die, that's in your sleep, that you're not going to wake up? Where do you come up with this? Every day and night you sleep and you wake up, sleep and wake up, sleep and wake up. The pattern will continue. Where did you come up with the idea that when you die you're sleeping and you'll never wake up? Where did this come up from? You'll close your eyes in this world and you'll open it in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the scary idea. This is what's been depicted in the verse. وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata. All these verses are talking to us about how it's proving to us the day of judgment. But logically, because the disbeliever doesn't believe in the Qur'an. So how do we convince him? What's around him? What he sees daily? وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا Sorry, وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ libasa, And we made the night a covering, a garment. Literally, the night covers. This is the clothing for the day, for this earth. It's a night. What kind of clothes do you make? What is it? You spend hours and hours to sew a jacket together? Or some clothes together? Allah made the night libas. That's the clothes Allah made for the night. That's the clothes you made? Compare it to what Allah made. Doesn't compare. وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ libasa. And can you get rid of the night? You can possibly turn on the light. But does it get rid of the night outside? It doesn't. Use whatever power you want to use in a light, like they use in the stadiums. It still didn't get rid of the night. So these are things you can't even control. How do you think you're in a position to speak about the Day of Judgment, when it happens and when it doesn't? وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا And we made the day, we made the day for seeking livelihood. Ma'asha gives two meanings. Means of livelihood, so in other words, during the day you go and work, and a time of livelihood. It's the time of work. It's the means of living, because in the day you work, you make money. So it's a means of living, and it's a time of living as well. And why is this important for the Arab? Allah is telling him that, look, in the Arabs, in the time of the, in the, in the deserts, they have very critical farms that a whole nation depends on, a whole community depends on. If there's no day, there's no sun. If there's no sun, it doesn't go to the crops and to the plant, it doesn't grow. What happens? No one can survive. So how important is the day? Reflect upon this mercy, this favor I've given you. وَبَنَيْنَا فَوْقَكُمْ سَبْعًا شِدَادًا And we constructed above you seven strong heavens. Now, it's all وَجَعَلْنَا 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 Then وَبَنَيْنَا Not وَجَعَلْنَا Why? It's giving us the idea of construction. What have you constructed? What's the, look at the Allah. He constructed the sky as a ceiling. What kind of ceiling have you made above your head? What is it? The fibro ceiling? Is this what you can make? Or the Arab in his time, what was what such a ceiling? Huh? From, from the branches of the date tree, of the palm tree? That's his ceiling. Compare it to Allah Azza wa Jal's construction, وَبَنَيْنَا Above, فَوْقَكُمْ Seven strong heavens. Not one, seven. This puts you in your place. Then Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا سِرَاجًا وَهَاجًا <coughs> And we made a shining lamp. Siraja, literally in the Arabic language, it refers to something that emits light. And in the Qur'an, 
it consistently refers to the sun. Wahaja means it's brilliant, it's blazing, it's bright. Again, what kind of light can you produce? Mm, a torch. What kind of fire can you kindle? Uh, a candle. Is this the fire you can make? Look at Allah Azza wa Jal's light. It's a sun that emits so bright light that it covers the world. That's Allah's torch. What's the torch you've made? No matter what light you make, it'll never compare to Allah Azza wa Jal's light. Literally, you're being put in your seat now. You have no, no control over what happens around you. And how do you deny the hereafter? We sent down from the clouds abundant water. Now the word mu'sirat is really interesting. Mu'sirat is referring, firstly it's referring to the winds that are really strong, that as a result they squeeze the clouds. Mu'sirat, asara. You get a cloth, you drench it in water, you pick it up, you squeeze it, it drops water. That's what this, the wind does to this cloud. It literally squeezes it. And then ma and thajjaja comes out. Flowing, heavy, profuse rain drops from these clouds. And the other meaning of mu'sirat is that they're so drenched in water that it just literally drops rain without being squeezed. وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُعْصِرَاتِ مَا أَنْ ثَجَّاجَ Again, you're being called to remember the favor of Allah. If Allah was to send too much rain, that will cause destruction and death. If He doesn't cause too much, not a lot of rain, there's no rain at all, that's drought, famine and every disease will happen. So Allah sends it مَا أَنْ ثَجَّاجَ Abundant. In exactly the, the fixed and appointed quantity comes down. So much that it keeps the land maintained as it is. If Allah willed for destruction, then that's a different story. That will be sent as a punishment. Allah says, لِنُخْرِجَ بِهِ حَبًّا وَنَبَاتًا This is interesting. So that we may bring out thereby grain, grains, crops, and plants, vegetation. But He uses the word لِنُخْرِجَ Why does Allah send this rain in profuse amounts and abundant rain? لِنُخْرِجَ Lamb here, Lamb at ta'lil the Lamb of reasoning. Why is this rain? So we can bring out, bring forth from the land, grains, crops, and vegetation. But something that's interesting is the word, the verb لِنُخْرِجَ Now when you speak about a plant coming out, you use the word لِنُمْبِتَ النَّبَتْ نَبَتْ is plant, أَنْبَتَ is the correct verb to use for when you're speaking about a plant coming from the earth. That's ambata. Kharaja is a verb used for humans. You walk out of the door, you come out, you leave this, this is khuruj. So what's being depicted? Allah is using the word that we refer to men. We refer to humans. In other words, Allah is saying the same way. This seed goes into the earth, and water comes onto it, and it comes out, the same thing is going to happen to you. You're going to eventually end up down there. You're going to become a seed, the end, the tailbone. Then Allah is going to send rain. Then you're going to grow out, just like the plant grows out. But the verb that's used is لنخرجة. So already لنخرجة is giving you a meaning that that's going to happen to you just like the plant. وَجَنَّاتٍ alfafa And gardens of luxurious growth. So habba literally means the grains, the crops, wheat and so on. Rice, that's habba. Nabata is actually the vegetation, right? The cucumber plant, the, the tomato, or the zucchini or so on. That's nabata. Habba are the grains. وَجَنَّاتٍ alfafa And gardens of luxurious growth. You know, lush gardens. That's وَجَنَّات. Jannat means literally gardens. And alfafa comes from laffa, which means they're wrapped around each other. So like the vine tree, for example. You see how it goes and into winds all into each other? That's why jannat in alfafa. And inshallah ta'ala, I'll conclude with inna yawm al-fasli kana miqata. And just to connect the first passage with the second, is that the first passage Allah is speaking to them about the hereafter and stop this nonsense. And you're soon going to find out 
then from a, as a mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, He reminds them of His favors. Or I did this and this and this and this and this. What puts you in this position? Then the topic goes back. Verily, the day of separation is a fixed time. In Yawm al-Fasl. And the day of judgment was called the Yawm al-Fasl, the day of separation, because on that day everything separates. Everything, literally everything. The truth from the falsehood separates. And the most graphic separation that happens is the pregnant mother. She'll deliver, she'll drop her load, tabar, drop, literally drop out of fear, and she won't even care where he is. She'll run away from him. That's the most graphic separation that happens on that day. The father will run away from his son. The brother will run away from his other brother. The husband will run away from the wife. That's Yom Al-Fasl, the day of separation. Everyone will separate. يُفْصَلُوا بَيْنَكُمْ And then one more thing to highlight in this verse. كَانَ مِيقَاتَ It has already been appointed. There's no contradiction. Don't even bother arguing. Because كَانَ مِيقَاتَ We've already appointed a fixed time for it. But what's interesting about the word miqata is, you know, the Arab is used to the sun having a fixed time. It comes out at this time, it sits down at this time. You know, the night comes at this time, the day comes at this time, the moon comes out at this time. And Allah is saying it, and the day of judgment also has a fixed time. Has exactly a fixed time. Once its time comes, it comes out. Subhanallah, this is uh, inshallah ta'ala, we'll leave the conversation till the end of the surah. Inshallah, next uh, lesson we'll finish the surah and uh, we'll speak about a few things in what we learn from the surah, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, we ask Allah Azza wa to make us people of the Quran, people that reflect from the reminders and the lessons from the Quran. And just before I conclude, uh, inshallah ta'ala, I'll we'll be announcing of four new classes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'll give you a time right now. Rather, I've got four papers in the back of four classes. The first class are those of you that do not know how to read the Arabic alphabet. Or do not know how to recognize the Arabic alphabet. So if you know Alif to Ya, but don't know how the Alif looks like, then you're from class one. If you do not know the letters and do not know how to recognize them, then if you're interested, write your name on class one. And answer, like filling in the, the blanks that are there. The second class is the Quran reading class. Those that know the alphabet, but actually don't know the Fatha, Kasra, Dhamma, Shadda, Sukun, they don't even know how to read, but they know the alphabet. Then you put your name, if you're interested, in the second class, class two, the Quran, the, the Quran reading course. The third class are those of you that know how to read, they're all right in reading. But the tajweed is not right. So if you want to learn the tajweed, and this is first, I'll begin with a beginner's course. That's class three. Just register your name if you're interested, inshallah ta'ala, in class three. And the fourth class are for those that know how to fluently read, but they want to memorize something. So inshallah ta'ala, if you haven't memorized juza amma, that will be the plan. And for the fourth class, those that are willing or those that want to memorize, then, if you don't know the Tajweed, obviously just put your name into the Tajweed course. Because once you learn from the Tajweed, you graduate to the other class, which is the memorization class. And if you want to enroll in the memorization and you know the Tajweed and you know how to read, then just write how, what have you memorized? How many Jizat have you memorized? So at the end, the names, if I get any names on that list, I'll know what all of you um, join in what you haven't memorized, then we'll pick a surah to memorize. And at the same time, we can explain, inshallah ta'ala, a few things. So if you know anyone else that's interested, then what you do is you basically just get him to message you and you speak back to me or so on. As I told you, this is just a list for now. Just I have an idea, I have names in front of me. So inshallah ta'ala, uh, once Allah gives us the will and the courage and the ability uh, to open up classes, then I'll send you a message and I'll tell you inshallah ta'ala the times and how the course will run inshallah ta'ala. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين